Good morning and welcome to worship for the 16th of May. Uh, welcome to Knox Presbyterian Church here in Georgetown, Ontario. This is also the service for Limehouse Presbyterian Church. But wherever you have joined us from, however you have arrived here this morning, we're grateful that you're here and we hope that this next hour of praise and worship will be uplifting to your soul and your spirit. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. So just a few announcements before we get into our worship proper. Uh, as always, a thank you to everyone who is making today possible, or recording possible. Craig is back on the board. Hayden uh, is, is playing our music. And Kathy will be joining me for our responsive reading in a few moments. This is the seventh Sunday of Easter. Uh, next week is the celebration of Pentecost, and we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. It is considered the birthday of the church, and uh, we'll, we'll be doing that celebration uh, as appropriately social distanced as we can. This week, uh, we will have our check-in. Last week, we didn't have it because I was off on study leave. Uh, so this week, we will be having our check-in on Zoom on Tuesday at 3 o'clock, and we'll have Bible study on Thursday. We'll be getting into the 10th chapter of Hebrews on Thursday. Pardon me, the questions should have gone around. You should have received them. If you didn't, let me know and I will send you a copy. We are pre-recording services. Uh, we have no idea when that's going to let up. Uh, and just a reminder, uh, this service was pre-recorded on the 8th of May. So if I don't know things and am not addressing certain things, that is why. I'd ask you to continue to pray for uh, Ted Brown and family as he recovers. There are many others that we could pray for by name, but they have not been commended to me personally to pray for. Uh, I can't pray for anybody by name where I haven't got permission to do that. We also pray for those who are asking for God's help while they are making difficult choices. We are praying for those who have realized that they have planted themselves in the wrong place and are struggling to shift to a new understanding of how to live. And we pray for those who have planted themselves in the Lord, are faithful whatever comes, life or death, prosperity or poverty, they realize they are the Lord's. And as always, I thank you for your faithful offerings and donations coming in and supporting the work of both congregations. Let us dedicate all we have and all we may give to God's purposes. Let us pray. Jesus, you made God known to us and we realize we already belong to him. All we have and all we are, we dedicate to God's service and to the glory of God's name. Thank you, Lord, for all we may share. Through Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. And let us come together for worship. Happy are those who do not ridicule and scoff, but who delight in God's teachings and meditate on them day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water. They yield fruit in due season, and their leaves do not wither. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn this morning is found at number 425 in your hymn books. We praise you, O God.
We praise you, O God, our Redeemer, Creator. In grateful devotion, our tribute we bring. We lay it before you, we kneel and adore you. We bless your holy name, glad praises we sing. We worship you, God ever faithful, we bless you. Through life's storm and tempest, our guide you have been. When perils o'ertake us, you will not forsake us. And with your help, O Lord, life's battles we win. With voices united, our praises we offer. And gladly our songs of true worship we raise. Our sins now confessing, we pray for your blessing. To you, our great Redeemer, forever be praise. And let us approach God in our prayers and our confessions. Let us pray. Holy and eternal God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together, even in this vague and seemingly disconnected way, to praise and worship you this morning. We long for the opportunity to gather together in our churches, to sit with our brothers and sisters in the faith, to raise our voices in prayer and in praise, and to hear ours join the chorus with those around us. We trust that you will bring us once again to that point, somehow, some way. But until that moment comes, we thank you that we can do this and gather in spirit on video. Gracious Lord, we know that we have not always been the people you created us to be. We've struggled and fallen short of your ideal for us. We wrest control of our lives and our destinies from you. Hold on to our struggles as though we have the solution to them and gather resources for hoarding out of fear that we will lose them and be left destitute. We fail to trust. We fail to surrender ourselves and our lives to you. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to lay down the things that we needlessly carry in order to take up the cross that you have made for us a cross that we are uniquely equipped to carry because we do not carry it alone. With Christ, we have the strength to endure. So help us to lay down our burdens and hold fast to your strength. We ask in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. In Christ Jesus, God has promised to forgive us and reconcile us to God and to each other. In Him, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. For our something to see this morning, uh, it's something to see in the world around us. We are getting to that time of year when many of us will start to plant our gardens. We'll go down to the garden center, we'll get various items in addition to the actual plants. We'll get some fresh soil, perhaps some compost, maybe even some peat moss or mulch to put on top. But the big things are the soil and the compost. We want to make sure that whatever we plant has a firm and nourishment-rich base so that it can grow and flourish. Then, of course, we need to keep it properly watered. Not too much, and hopefully not too little, so that everything keeps growing and whatever we planted can thrive. The Bible has two gardens in it, of course. I'm thinking of Eden and Gethsemane. 
Eden represents the state of perfection, where life is lived in concert with God and all is well. Gethsemane is where Jesus prayed before his crucifixion. And yet it was also a place where he would teach his disciples about faith and love and grace and God. I've always thought of Eden as being, uh, as the garden being referenced in the song, In the Garden. We encounter God the Father and experience his loving care. And it's a place where we are always at peace. In many ways, it's a vision of heaven, which is one reason we sing it at funerals. However, I recently discovered a slightly different song that also speaks of a garden where we encounter Jesus. And to me, it sounds like Gethsemane. We come to Jesus with our struggles, with our burdens and cares, and we are blessed and sent forth once more in confidence and peace. The song is called The Beautiful Garden of Prayer, and it was written about a hundred years ago by a woman named Eleanor Schroll. Let's walk with Jesus in the garden of his love and enjoy this song together. There's a garden
our responsive reading for today is Psalm 1. We go all the way back to the beginning of the psalm book, and I invite Kathy to come forward and we'll read Psalm 1 responsively. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so are the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Our reading from Acts this morning is from Acts chapter 1, uh, a split reading. We're reading verses 15 through 17, and then we pick it up at verse 21 and read to the end, verse 26. should preface it by saying that this is after the disciples have returned from the mount where Jesus was uh, taken up into heaven and the angels have sent them back to Jerusalem to be about the Lord's business. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was among us, or was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven disciples. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us take a moment and meditate and ruminate upon this as we declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
And now, Lord, may you speak through me, or if need be, in spite of me. As we meditate upon this word further, it gives wisdom and understanding, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So a question to start today. How do you determine a right choice? We're faced with choices every day. From the moment our minds swim up from consciousness into wakefulness uh, until we close our eyes at night. When to actually swing our legs out of bed, whether or not we're going to shower today. Uh, what is going to make it onto our to-do list? How much time we're going to give to each item on the list? What we're going to eat, when we're going to eat, what we're going to do in our evenings, and when we're going to turn our lights off and try to go to sleep, as well as 10,000 other points and moments in between those. Some choices are easy. I want cereal for breakfast. There are two cereals in the cupboard. What do I feel like today? If I really can't decide between them, I could always flip a coin or pour some of both in each bowl. But the odds are pretty good that I will choose between them without much of a struggle. Many, I dare say most of the choices we make in a day, we do automatically, without a lot of thought or consideration. And for most of those choices, we probably don't bring God into the equation at all. I mean, most of us don't wait on the Almighty to help us decide, God, is it time for me to get out of bed? God, should I take a shower? God, while I'm in the shower, should I wash my hair? God, should I put on socks today? I read a story one time about a woman who had tried to do this, who had tried at every point in her day to, you know, whenever she found herself facing a choice, to pray a little prayer and wait for something to indicate to her what the correct choice should be. Alas, she was finding that her morning was taking her until almost noon, and after a time she found herself modifying the discipline a bit. For instance, it's a, if it's a cold morning, it makes sense to wear socks, and if nothing stopped her, she would put the socks on and, and move on with her day. On some days, though, we are indeed faced with some major choices. Should we look for a new job? Should we buy a new car? Should we ask the person we've been seeing to make things a bit more permanent? Which of these people should we bring on as a partner in the business? How can I address this pressing social need? Some of our choices, well, they're left or right. Others are stop something we're doing or keep moving forward with it. Still others require us to choose from a menu of options. And we can make these decisions with care and consideration, or we can make them with input from others. And input from God is usually the best input of all. One of the questions, though, is how does God speak to us? How does God reveal his will to us? With a voice? With a feeling? With a dream or a vision? With the unmistakable sense that this is the correct way or through something else altogether? I always find it curious that the choice of Matthias to replace Judas as uh, one in the circle of the twelve seems to have fallen into this latter category. They cast lots, the text says, between himself and Barsabbas, and the lot fell to him. And so he was added to the number of the other eleven apostles. No one's exactly sure what they did. There are many suggestions, but nothing is 100% certain. But whatever it was, was about as precise as flipping a coin. And whoever had been chosen, it appears that either one would have been acceptable by the group. So they felt that among themselves, they couldn't decide fairly 
between the two. So they invoked God and set about casting lots. However, they did that. Now, it may surprise and shock you a bit to hear me say that theoretically, technically, casting lots to make a decision like this was a violation of Torah, violation of the law. To use an action that is seemingly random in order to allow God or the gods to answer a question you have for him or them is a process with the ancient name of claromancy. That suffix, mancy, is derived from the ancient Greek work for divination, which is essentially some kind of magical process for telling the future. And anything that smacks of magic has long been forbidden by God's faithful people. I mean, you're trying to get God to speak through the throwing of the bones or the innards of a chicken by interpreting the way the flames move in the bonfire or the pattern of the tea leaves left in the bottom of your cup. You're getting into magic and sorcery, which is the power of the self, and an attempt to assert your own will over God. You become like the organ grinder attempting to force your monkey, in this case God, to dance anytime you crank the handle. And that's not right on a lot of levels. Thus, Leviticus, Leviticus 19.26b, among a bunch of other thou shalt nots, says, do not practice divination or seek omen. In no other place in the New Testament do the people of Jesus do anything like this to determine the will of God. However, having said this, what we see at the end of this passage is that the rest of the disciples, including Barsabbas, accept the result of this process. They accept that it is the will of God and they surrender to it. They put Matthias in among the circle of the twelve and move on with preparing themselves to take the gospel into the world. And next week, as I say, we will have our annual encounter with Acts 2 in the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But what I want to focus on for the rest of my time this morning is the idea of us surrendering ourselves to God of letting God guide us and direct us and show us our path and our way. Whether it's through the rather neutral and mundane decisions of what to eat for breakfast or the more major decisions like the ones I mentioned. How do we know something is of God and what should we do when we realize that this is so? Well, first and foremost, I would put forward to you that if something is of God, then it will be something that shows love. Agape love, the fourth kind of love. The love that Paul talks about in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians is a care and concern for the well-being, the, the, the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of everyone around you. I read 1 Corinthians 13 at weddings to speak to the couples and the congregations about what love should look like. But it's so much more than, than just what you have between a man and a woman. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. We often refer to the two key verses that Jesus said were the points upon which the whole of the law and the prophets hinge. Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And Leviticus 19, the second half of verse 18, And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
if it is of God, then it by necessity shows love. Now, the law was intended to guide God's people towards showing love and reverence for God and or love and respect for one's neighbors. That was its intention. Every commandment in the Torah should be run through this filter. How does this particular commandment implore me to show love either to God or to my neighbor? So then, if we read the manner of the selection of Matthias as an attempt to submit to the will of God, to show reverence for the authority of God, well, then it becomes okay. It's not a request to have the monkey dance. It's a request to help us dance to the correct tune. First Psalm, as I've noted before, sets off the entire book with this theme of God's people needing to surrender themselves to Him. Blessed is the man, it begins, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. I always remember reading a commentary on that first verse where the commentator was trying to show how, you know, as the sinner continues to pursue the way of sin, he gets more and more comfortable with it. You know, he's less rushed. And finally, he's sitting and planting himself in a position that allows him to mock the faithful. But the godly people lean on the law as that which leads them to a life of love and reverence for God and compassion for those around them. And on it they meditate day and night. Not so that they can avoid its pitfalls. Not so that they can judge others as less perfectly observant than themselves. But so that they are aware of God's call upon them to love in all things and in all circumstances. It's not always easy to show love. Sometimes it's a lot easier to show anger and hate. Sometimes it's a lot easier to do nothing at all, but to, or turn and walk away. Drop your head, tend to your own needs. But God's call upon us is to care and to love and occasionally to do something. A few years ago, I was down at my mother's. We were visiting her during the summer, and we were there in time to go to uh, Sunday worship at her congregation, a little more modern congregation. And they showed this video that I'm about to insert into uh, the service here. Uh, I will advise you to turn your speakers down a little bit, unless you like your hard rock loud, like I do. It's a song by Nickelback, and the sentiment of the song is bound up in the thought that if only the world could love each other and care for each other, like a young couple who are in love, think everything revolves around making the other person happy, the world would be a much better place. The chorus, which is the critical part of the song, says this. If everyone cared and nobody cried, if everyone loved and nobody lied, if everyone shared and swallowed their pride, we'd see a day when nobody died. Interspersed in the video are a few brief stories of people who were confronted with something horrible, saw something in the world that was not showing love. And they then tried to do something that did. Take a look.
And that quote from Margaret Mead, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. In a more recent movie about the life of Jesus, he's shown calling one of his earliest disciples. And he says, I want you to come with me. And the man asks, but what are we going to do? And Jesus smiles and replies, change the world. If we surrender ourselves, truly surrender ourselves and our way to the will of God, then we too will change the world. One step one moment, one life at a time. Let's pray about this. Almighty God, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving one who set the world in motion and gave everything upon it life and breath. How arrogant we are to think that we deserve even a modicum of control over anything. And yet you give it to us, and wow, what a mess we make of it. You have a path for each of us. You have a way of love that you want us all to follow. A plan that if only we would show love and grace and compassion to one another... It would allow the world to thrive in ways that we can scarcely imagine. But instead, you gave us free will, the ability to choose left from right, right from wrong. And in our greed, in our selfishness, and in our foolish responses to the devil's temptations, we go the wrong way. We fail to surrender to you, and we wrest control of our lives for ourselves. And oh, as I say, what a mess we make of it. Father of love, help us to shrug off some of the complacency we've allowed to settle on our lives lately. The spiritual languor that has paralyzed us as we lament over and over whether or not the current situation will ever end. Remind us that you are in charge, that you know the way forward, that you are the one in whom we should place our trust and seek our confidence and satisfaction. You indeed call us to share, to care for one another, to seek the best for one another, to swallow our pride and our urges to elevate ourselves above others, to live as though our steps, our words, our actions matter. To you and to the world as a whole. Help us to change the world through our faith, our love, and your grace shining out through us. Merciful Lord, hear us now as we lift up to you the needs of many in this world around us. For those who are dealing with crises of health or personal welfare, we lift them up to you. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are struggling with finances and don't know where to turn, we lift them up to you. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are imprisoned by their lifestyle, their choices, their mistakes, their poor decisions, or their addictions. We lift them to you. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are caught in the web of control and who need to find a way to let go of the things they think are holding them back from a fuller, more loving life, we lift them to you. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are trying to find a new and better, more loving and more grace-filled way to live, we lift them to you. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are moved to find a way to change or address an evil in the world, 
but don't know where to start, we lift them to you. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are laboring to make the world a better place, one day, one hour, one moment at a time, we lift them to you. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear the prayers of our individual hearts as we lift people around us and their situations to you in a brief, silent moment. Now, Lord, bind our prayers together as we use the words that Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn for this morning is one that I thought was very appropriate given our theme of surrender today. Uh, it's not in the hymn books, but I'm sure you know it. All to Jesus I surrender. I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All 
to Jesus I surrender. Now I feel the sacred flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation. Glory, glory to his name. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. So living in the love of Christ, be open to God calling you to something new in your life. Jesus Christ has already given us over into the arms of a loving God. Therefore go in the spirit of peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The service is ended. Go in peace.